Are you interested in pairing your expertise on distillation with the business side, such as finance, marketing, and operations? Well, you should check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's an online program and can be completed in as little as six courses. It's taught by both UofL business faculty and corporate fellows from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and more. Learn more and get enrolled into this online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. There's a new four grain bourbon that's been taking the market by storm, Penelope Bourbon. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced four grain flavor comes from a unique blend of three bourbon mash bills. Currently available in two expressions, 80 proof and cash drink, Penelope sips well neat, but also makes a great Kentucky mule. So look for Penelope's award-winning bourbons in select markets. And of course, online at PenelopeBourbon.com. Are you looking for an app to track your tasting notes and bottles, but also connect with other bourbon drinkers? The Oak Bottle Tasting app uses powerful analytics to suggest new spirits for you based on your reviews and the tasting notes that you enjoy. Explore the feed to like and comment on the tastings of your friends, distilleries, and verified tasters. With over 250 different tasting notes, recording your own tastings has never been easier or more accurate. Join the fastest growing community of tasters today. Search for Oak Bottle app on the Apple App Store. Bless you. Excuse me, I have, I have a you dry sure? cough. And a, you sure? You sure? <laughs> I have a dry cough and a... Um, Making me nervous, Fred. Loss of, loss of sense of flavor and yeah. taste over My there. My tasting notes have been really just neutral lately. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 270 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start talking to Jackie Zycan today, here's your weekly bourbon news update. Jeff Arnett, the longtime master distiller at Jack Daniels, and our guest back on episode 150, where he answered the question, is Jack Daniels a bourbon, is stepping down after his 20-year career with Brown Foreman. In a post shared on Fred Minnick's blog, Jeff said it was his decision to resign as he has big plans for the future. Is that a new distillery? Is it a totally new direction? Is he just gonna retire and knit? Who knows? We don't know what's gonna happen, but you can follow up on his Instagram at head underscore distiller underscore eight for the latest updates. And Brown Foreman will announce his successor in the upcoming weeks. Moving on to bourbon release news, Heaven Hill Distillery has announced the release of the fall 2020 edition of Old Fitzgerald Bottled and Bond Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey and it will be at 14 years old in those sweet decanter bottles. Comprised of barrels produced in fall of 2005 and bottled in the fall of 2020, it's the sixth national release, and this edition will be available with a suggested retail price of $140. Rabbit Hole is announcing the Founders Collection, where Cave Zamanian, who you heard back on episode 194, will develop special bottlings that showcase his creativity and their commitment to the artistry of whiskey making. This first release is the Box Grail Founders Collection Kentucky Straight Rye Whiskey. This limited edition cast strength expression will be made from the first batches of rye whiskey that he ever made. It had an entry proof 110 in charred number three New Oak American barrels. It was aged for six years, will be bottled at 114.6 proof, and will be available in October for suggested retail price of $195. Only 1,315 bottles will be available. Dixon Deadman, the master blender at Kentucky Al, and our guest back on episode 27 and 160, spent five months creating an ultra rare small batch bourbon called Dry State. With hand selected barrels of whiskey aged at least 12 years old and up to 17 years, being part of the blend, it's just limited to 2,000 bottles, and they're all hand signed by Dixon himself. Dry State will be available at select spirit retailers and priced at $1,000. But as an added sweetener, Christie's will also be auctioning off five bottles at a starting price of $1,900 for each for charity. All proceeds will go to the National Restaurant Association's Employee Advancement Fund starting on September 17th. Now for today's podcast, Jackie Zykin, she's a Bourbon Pursuit alumni who's now a three-timer on the podcast. You can catch her previously on episodes 40 and 177. But this time around, we talk about how Old Forester is starting to really win over bourbon lovers. We chat about this year's birthday bourbon, 
having a barrel proof offering in the single barrel program, and the story behind President's Choice, plus a lot more. Have you tried an Old Forester 1915? Well, if you never heard of it, get ready to start blending. And make sure you're hitting that subscribe button to never miss an episode. We release Whiskey Quickies on Tuesdays as bonus episodes, so if you're not subscribed, you may not be seeing them. And Barrel Craft Spirits, they're reeling home awards for all of their blends. And we should know, we selected two barrels from their private release series, and they are amazing. And you can get your hands on some of Joe's favorites by going to BarrelBourbon.com and getting a bottle shipped today. With that, enjoy today's episode, and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick, and this is Above the Char. Today as I record this, it's Labor Day, the day that we are meant to celebrate the American worker for their efforts in fighting for better wages and better conditions. Now, in American whiskey, look, we're at a point right now where we're just out there hunting bottles and celebrating what is America's spirit, and you got Kenny's you know, pursuit for that sweet oak note and my never-ending love for the marzipan note. And the fact is, is we kind of treat this a little bit like a sport. And sometimes we forget that inside those warehouses on the bottom lines are waged and salary employees that are busting their asses to meet the demand for us. And we get all upset about the distilleries for their allocation issues, but in there somewhere, is somebody trying to support their family. And over the years, the distilleries have faced strikes. They have faced uh, basically complaints from, from the union workers by not being fairly compensated. Most recently, we had the Jim Beam strikes in 2016. That made uh, a lot of national news. But the fact is, is there is a historical connection between distillery workers complaining that they're not getting properly compensated while the distillery is making money hand over fist. One of the big national news stories of the 1930s were the strikes in Illinois, in Pekin and at the American Distilling Company, and in Peoria at the Hiram Walker in, um, in the mid-1930s and early 1940s. There were multiple strikes where people got seriously injured, and they kind of became some of the faces of those labor disputes back in the day. In Kentucky, there were quite a few strikes that would happen at Brown Forman, National Distillers. Um, in Pennsylvania, the Joseph Finch Company had a lot of strikes, but there's really one distillery, one distillery, in my opinion, that has the has this they get a black eye for it. They they have some egg on their face for it. And that was Stitzel Weller. Workers went on strike there in 1961 and continuously had uh, major issues uh, with with their relationships with the with the labor. And wh- one of the big things was they said that they were harassing employees. And if you look back, if you think about what would have been considered harassment in 1961, you know it had to be really bad because today, you know, y- you tell someone. Um, that might offend them in the slightest, and you got a lawsuit on their hands. Back then, though, you could get away with a lot more. So, in, in or for the for the workers to come out and strike in 1961 for quote harassment, as well as a 20 cent per hour wage increase, you know, it had to be a really big deal. So, when Pappy Van Winkle dies some years later, you know, that was in a large part that was his local legacy was the was the condition with the workers. With that said, things got resolved pretty easily. There was a lot of um, effort to try and mend those issues. and uh, But those were those were some major problems for Stitzel Weller back in the day. So where are we now with labor? Well, right now, as far as all my contacts say, all, um, all unions and distilleries are in good relationships. And in fact, when times are bad, that's usually when you see the stillers kind of, you know, appreciating their workers just a little bit more. But I will say that most distilleries are really good to their employees. But when they're not, we sure find out about it. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, if you get a chance, thank a distillery worker because they're working their butts off right now. Until next week, cheers. 
And welcome back to an episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of Bourbon. Kenny and Fred here today talking with a veteran of the show, somebody that's been on here. And, you know, this was coming. It was, we got to, we always get the, the PR emails and saying like, hey, we've got this and this coming out. Would you like to have so-and-so on the show? And I would say 90% of the time I look at them like, no, we've got our own thing going on, blah, blah, blah. And then when they started talking about like, hey, we've got this old Forrester birthday thing coming out. Well, of course, people's eyebrows are raised and, mm -hmm. and they're like, would you like to have Jackie on the show? I'm like, we haven't had Jackie on the show in over two years. And oh, I, said, we've just, no. I was like, we've got to get Jackie back on. Has it been two years? It's true. Mm -hmm. It's a true statement. And that's what I was just like, sign her up. I don't even care if it's about birthday bourbon. We're just going to talk and have a good time. Well, you know, I mean, Jackie's just one of the coolest people uh, in the world. Of course, you know, I got to spend a lot of time with her, do this story on her for uh, Bourbon Plus. And, um, you know, she's on the cover of that. And I got to know her uh, a lot more through that, through that process. And I think she's an amazing human being. I really, really do. And, um, you know, everyone wants to talk about bourbon and whiskey and all that. But I think sometimes... We forget that these folks are also humans, and I think we should always po point out when someone's just a great person, and and Jackie is. So, and now I'll be Aww. taking now I'll be taking that check that you uh, <laughs> promised me. <laughs> is the you said you weren't going to talk about it. Oh yeah, <laughs> but seriously, I just uh, I just think you bring so much to the conversation of whiskey, and uh, I appreciate uh, all you do uh, for whiskey and you know for the community. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And so, Jackie, one of the things we've been doing new this season, we're kind of starting with like a random icebreaker. And so we'll, we'll throw Ooh. this one this way. So if you had a time machine, would you go back in time or into the future? Oh, man, this gets weird. This gets really, really weird, right? I honestly, I hate the idea of a time machine at all. At oh, all. Oh, gosh. No, there's the whole butterfly effect thing, right? Like you don't want to mess with it. You don't want to go forward. You know, you don't want to ruin it for yourself because eventually – are you going to have to return back to the quote unquote present? You're just going to ruin your present moment for the rest of your life. If you peek forward, I wouldn't want to go back maybe go back, but like way, way back to a time before I was there just to see, but I don't think I want to go back to like anything in my life whatsoever. I'm good right where I'm at. To be like, to like see a Tyrannosaurus Rex and be like, yeah, be like, be like they be were like, actually purple. Yeah, Cause but, like everyone guesses on the color. Like you find bones and stuff, but does anyone realize that that dinosaurs like illustrated and like, animated and all these things like you're guessing on a color of the skin well and also they had feathers that's something that's been that's been coming out lately let's go fred we're going yeah. we're going back to find the feathers it's that and the you know we watched jurassic park and all the sounds that they make it's all just made up sounds exactly. you have no idea they could just have like thank really you. high pitch like thank you oh no they're yeah. talking english they're like hey um you know <laughs> right what's going on over here they, they were stand. very well spoken are you going I'm to the watering hole this afternoon hey try try sarah tops I got some big fucking teeth. I'm about to eat you. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. I'm sticking with backwards, but backwards prior to 1984. Just don't sneeze back then, maybe. Yeah. Just I think don't. Wasn't that a Simpsons thing? Like he goes back in time, he sneezes and then kills all the dinosaurs or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the Simpsons did it. They always do. What about you, Fred? Would you go back in time or into the future? Uh, I'd go back in time to when I had this cheeseburger in El Reno, Oklahoma, and this it was just it. Perfect. This, this, there's this place there called Johnny's, and they it was the best cheeseburger I've ever had in my life. I'd probably go back to that moment and eat the cheeseburger again. That is very precise. Yeah, you know, you've been you know baking on that one for a while now. Do you think you about know, this burger often? I think about this cheeseburger all the time. And it, it's it, it's and it's and it's funny. Like the minute that you brought this up, I was like, man, I wish I could go back and eat that cheeseburger. <laughs> as soon as I said, he's like, mm, cheeseburgers. I it, mean. I mean, and then I've been back there, you know, since, and it's not the same, but, you know, that moment, man, right there with that cheeseburger and the special real estate put on top of it. Oh my You God. bring up something very important, though. You go back, you are yourself today going back. You've been back multiple times. Was there something about who you were the first time you had that burger that made it so much more exceptional? Yeah, and how old were you when you had this cheese? I was 19, feather back, no gray hair. I had abs and I could curl, you know, 75 pounds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we just let you keep going. I mean. <laughs> I just see where this takes us. Uh, yeah, I would say that back then, I was, uh, I had just gotten off work. I was working at the El Reno Country Club golf course there and I was pouring cement. So I was, um, I was really tired, really worn out from the day. I met my friend JL at Johnny's. 
we sat down. I got a Coke and the cheeseburger. And then I think, uh, you know, the onion rings or something, but that they weren't that memorable. But the cheeseburger and the Coke just... Coke as in soda or Coke as in an actual Coca-Cola or Coke? An actual Coca-Cola. Okay. Coke. Okay. I always have to like... Well, say, normally, you know, normally when we're talking, you're asking about a different type of Coke. No. <laughs> but, oh, no. my goodness. Zing. Did I go there? It always comes back to drugs around here. It does. <laughs> Why does that keep happening? I don't know. Mm-hmm. There's this inner bourbon community people just don't know about. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, want, you want to talk about a secondary mark. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I might be a little bit different. Like, I think I would go into the future only because I come from the tech space and like, I really want to see self-driving cars and damn BFB, I'd rather start seeing flying cars and whatever the future is going to look like. I just think it's, there's just so much potential of things that we'll never get to see in our lifetime that I just want to be able to see what it would be. I'm afraid to go into the future. You know, we go yeah, there. Yeah, exactly. What if it was like, what if it was just like nothing? What if it was exactly. like the Matrix? Like, you know just what I mean? Black. Everyone's like, in a, you're yes. Just like and looking you're around like, like well, I guess, well, uh, <laughs> hop back in the DeLorean. Let's, let's go back right. to, to 2020. That's like, you know, people uh, People like to get their palms red and they like to get their future stole. One of those people come near me, I like run. Like, I don't want to know anything about my future. I just want to live. Or I can go back in time and eat that cheeseburger again. Yeah, or go back and eat the cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. I was pretty big into philosophy in college. And so, you know, um, I forget whose theory it was that said basically everything's already planned out for you versus do you already have free will to actually choose what you want to do? Yeah, I'm familiar with that one. So, I think it's a combination of both. I think there's a little bit of both. You definitely have the free will to choose whether or not to follow the plan that could be there for your best interest for who you are in this lifetime, mm-hmm. for sure. Wow, we went really deep there real quick. God, it got real deep. (laughs) It did. (laughs) Went from cheeseburgers to philosophy real fast. What else you got? I think we should just move on to whiskey a little bit. Okay. You know what? That's that's true. I I, I would say like let's let's extend the travel back and the travel time thing to whiskey. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. if you were to travel back in time and grab a bottle of whiskey, what would it be? Oof. For me. That's a tough one. You know, I haven't had probably near as much as you have, but I've had a few really good pours. And I think one of the ones that I had was uh, from a a friend of mine actually here in town. And he brought out an old Rip Van Winkle 15 year Lawrenceburg squat bottle for me. Oh, yeah. And that was probably one of the top five pours I've ever had. Mm. That was something, something really, really special. Awesome. Jackie? I don't want to drink whiskey from back in time. I don't. I'm weird about old whiskey. We've I'm talked re- to you about yes, that. You're not a I'm big fan of Dusty's. I'm not. I'm really, really not. I think, you know, in this day and age, the distilled spirits category is very highly regulated and for everyone's health best interests. And I think there's a lot of stuff that slipped through back in the day and I don't want any part of it. I'm good. Well, I would say after, between uh, things started kicking in around the 40s that nothing would have slipped through back You'd then. You'd be amazed. Yeah, maybe. And I will stop talking now. Well, I do know. But, that. Do you have you have other stories that you want to share? No, no, there, no. <laughs> she, I don't. Yeah. She I goes know into all kinds uh, of things. You know, you you go to Brown Form and you reach a certain level and you get they bring you into the top secret room. Okay, this is what actually happened between 1940 and 1972, <laughs> and uh, the bodies are over here and there and. Uh, no, it's not. No, 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 no. Oh, they didn't tell um, you about the bodies. No, I haven't gotten to that level yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe eventually I'll find out where the bodies are, but um, no, I just think, and then you really like look at the process. The main thing you're going to be changing from back then is a distillation process, right? You're going to be changing that format. Everything else that's a contribution to it, the wood isn't changing. Like it is what it is. I would rather go back and taste something really like much more interesting, something more along the lines of like a really, really old original Aquavit or something of that sort, like getting into weird really like spice driven flavor profiles and stuff. I thought you were going to say like absinthe from back in like the Van Gogh. Oh, I could do that for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And then cut your ear off. No, God, man, today you're just. Am I dark? Just gruesome. You're, you are dark today. Well, he mentioned Van Gogh. So naturally absinthe. Well, I mean, that is the story. I didn't go that he, there. I mean, that is the story. You know, Van Gogh did cut his ear off because of absinthe and, you know, exactly. whatever, whether, whether it was a green fairy or not. But I think it would be interesting to kind of go back in time and figure out, you know, because they've always talked about with absinthe today, like, oh, yeah, it's got wormwood in it and all that sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. there's there's something that's not there because I've tried absinthe wormwood and it's I, I didn't have any of that sort of side effect. I still went out that night and partied. 
the side effects were also just part of the wine industry going, oh shit. So can I say that? Is that okay? To That's say okay. okay. Yeah, you're good. I dropped the okay. bomb early. Okay. So yeah, um, we, get, we get that explicit. Song. Trying to scare people off of it. Just like remember back in the day when everyone was like, eggs are terrible for you. No one should eat eggs, blah, blah, blah. It's because they were using eggs to harvest vaccines and cultures of that sort. And it was like, watch out for the egg supply. Tell everyone eggs are bad. I'm not making any of this up either. But absence went through the same thing of like, Ooh, watch out. Like you're going to, you're going to lose your mind. You're going to go crazy. You're going to hallucinate, blah, blah, blah. It was never actually a side effect of it. It was just other industries. Absinthe madness. Absinthe madness. Mm. But yeah. still fun to taste. Propaganda. You know? Mm-hmm. This is the world we're living in, man. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, it is. Constant. So I would travel, if I could travel back in time and, and get a whiskey, I would like to taste something from James C. Crow, like the the renowned, uh, you know, distiller who basically kind of, you know, perfected, science, you know, the early scientific methods of distillation. His uh, his whiskey was, not, was so good that people who were running for governor in Kentucky would actually say, vote for me and you'll get a shot of some, some James C. Crow and... And the last, uh, the last barrels of uh, of his whiskey burned down in the Galt House fire um, in the 1880s, sometime. But his whiskey was uh, anyone who ever tasted it was just like there's nothing even close. And so I'd like to go back and taste his stuff uh, fresh out of the barrel because um, because of that reputation he had. Yes, but it's the cheeseburger all over again, right? Back then, they're like, <laughs> "This is some really good stuff." And think of how many whisk how many whiskeys have you tasted, Fred? For God's sake! I, exactly. I don't, I don't like, know. who even knows? You've had some really, really good, really high quality stuff. God's probably taking note. Like, all right, you're just gonna keep on going. Keep on going here. We're in here. Another eighteen thousand. That's another. Uh, that's another scar on your liver, pal. <laughs> yeah. You'll be praying for this one when you're sixty. <laughs> <laughs> So I'll, I'll kind of bring it up to a modern day, Jack. I'll throw a fun question at you because we've always seen, there's a lot of people that love the old Forrester series. And, you know, of course there's, I think today there's, there's the ongoing debate of, you know, 1920 versus 1910, everybody's mm -hmm. favorite, you know, I'm a big fan of 1910 because I like that's more like uh, more caramel kind of like, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of flavor versus 1920s is a little more in your face, a little more spicy, a little more robust, but people are always like, if you tried a 1915, you know, they actually, they combine the two together. They make their own blend. Have you, uh, have you tried that? 100%. I promote it constantly. It's not a product that exists. If anyone listening is like, where do I find it? You don't. That's the answer. You buy two bottles. That's how we get you. You know, you got to try the 1915, get the two. Um, when 1910 first came out and it sold so quickly, it was something that we started seeing on social media of people doing that were cutting it with 1920 and jokingly call it 1915. Now it's a thing. And I've legitimately considered doing a bottling for like distillery only retail shop. That's 1915, just small batches of it. Why not? It's delicious. It's the best of both worlds. It's a perfect combination. Fred, I know you're not a fan of the 1910. That's okay. Wow. He, man, she's got a good hey, memory. Hey, own your opinions. That's no, fine. No, I, de well, I definitely was going to bring up that but uh <laughs> but what about the 1915 have you tried uh it? you know what my my disdain for 1910 has basically kept that out of the house and kept 1920 on the shelf which i love so well that's okay yeah I've, yeah i mean that's just, that's just it everyone has their own thing but mm -hmm. uh, I, I i do love the culture of uh, of home blending and i love that i love the 1915 story I mean, people are digging it. I mean, it's an awesome opportunity for people to just kind of like have fun with the product as well. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, you probably couldn't call it 1950 internally because don't don't all those have to coincide with some kind of special date or something that happened at the distillery? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's You know what happened in 1915 at Brown Foreman? What happened in 1915? Something. something. I, oh, I bet we could find it. <laughs> we could just look through the archives. This is when they hired so-and-so and they sold that barrel. And that <laughs> became this. See, there's, easy. Where there's a will, there's a way. Easy way to find. Let, something. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, here's an. Here's a thought. Like, okay, so 1915 is is when it's half and half. When it's when it leans toward 1920, does it become 1916? Yes, the year is dependent on the proportion of the years that compose the blend completely. This is just awesome. I love this. Could have a whole series. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is great. Yeah. You don't need to make more like official release series. Just come out with some sort of cheat sheet that says like, you know, one and a half ounces of this, the half ounce yeah, of this. Yeah, but, oh, this is this going to get tricky because there's other years we're not considering, I know, right? 1897. So you got to think about that. If you've got primarily 1920 and you throw 1897 in there, just a dash, and you bring it to where the proportions make it, 1915, 
it's not going to be the same 1915. So we have to commit. This is just between 1910 and 1920. Those are the only mm. ones we can work. You know what I'm saying? Well, I mean, have Otherwise, you tried adding in like an 1897? Then you end up with, yeah, like you said, like a 1993. You're like, where did this come from? <laughs> <laughs> And then you finish it with Weller. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, Fred. <laughs> I swear. And so one of the other things we kind of want to bring you on the show today, because I know that uh, you have taken a leading role now in doing a lot of the, the birthday bourbon mm-hmm. stuff. So kind of talk about, you know, you learned a lot from Chris Morris and sort of that that path of, of really what it took to find the right barrels and everything like that. And I know that you've crawled through Rick houses with them. So kind of talk about just the process of kind of following his lead and kind of learning from him and then being able to kind of take on birthday bourbon on your own. Yeah. Well, I mean, Chris and I are very different people. Very different people. I, did you know this? I didn't know this. You didn't know that? No. I mean, um, I thought you were just like him. <laughs> no, Duh, this guy, I swear, right on a roll. Um, But I am very, very grateful for my time that I've spent with him from the very beginning of my career at Brown Foreman. He was the first person to take me into the warehouse and show me, this is the stave you want to hit. Look at the different colors of wood. The lighter the wood, the softer the wood is going to be. And when you're going to have to drill 100 of these in a row, you're going to make it easier on yourself. Granted, I am very, I, I come from a scientific mindset where I want things to be as reduce the variables as much as possible. I am a very type A person. It's to a very bad fault. I realize that. But Chris and I are just different in our detail-orientedness in the warehouse. We'll just put it that way. Um, but the birthday bourbon thing has always been really fun. Um, because it's the it's like the crowning thing of like yeah, Old Forster when is. it feels like it comes out. I mean, everybody just goes bananas for it. Well, yeah. And he's seen it from when people didn't care. And now he sees it this way. So imagine his whole perspective on it is very, very different from mine because my introduction to birthday bourbon was from a buying side and was like, how much can we get? We need more, 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 like fight for cases. So I've always seen it from this realm. So mm-hmm. um, I don't know. It just takes on, I think there's another level of pressure that I have upon myself because it's always been this super, super hyper special thing from Old Forester. So I make sure to not spill a single drop. I make sure to not ever waste any, it's very, it's, it's a thing. Yes, you'll see me out and about like when there are bars open. I've been known to order a birthday bourbon old fashioned. I don't care. Like, whatever. I love it. It makes a really good old fashioned. I'm not ruining it. But when how it comes expensive to is that old fashioned? A lot. It's very expensive. <laughs> that's the answer. Um, Company credit card. But when it comes just to like. Just it down. She's just trying to show off of that. No, point. it's so good. <laughs> Try it. And buy one for someone. And then they're like, I can't believe you did that. And you're like, just drink it. We make it for you to drink it. Um, I don't know. I have learned quite a bit of things about him. And most importantly, I've learned to identify exactly what my palate is and what my preferences are in relation to Mm -hmm. his, because we do not agree on many things. Um, He always goes a little bit bolder, a little bit spicier. I'm always a little bit on the sweeter side and a little bit more well-rounded side. Um, There's no right or wrong to it. We're just different. So when we do the proofing process, we go through and we taste, you know, 86 proof, 87, 88, 89 every proof point from 86 up to barrel strength for each birthday bourbon lot that we gather that sample for. And it's just silence. And then I have my little system of like shifting glasses, like North, South, East or West, like in front of me. And like, I know where everything is. I'm sure he has the tension in the room. Just like you can feel it. It's awkward. It's really awkward. I'm not going (laughs) to, you don't want to be there on that day. You're just like, but um, at the end of it though, every now and then, there are years, this year was one of them. Um, and then there was a couple of years back that we actually had a lot of the same shifted glasses and same marks of which ones we kind of wanted to go back to and rediscover. So um, this year is the first year that we weren't fighting about proof. He always wants higher, I always want lower. Um, and not like lower, like let's go as low as we possibly can. It's just kind of where the flavors express themselves from my palate preference. And this year we agreed. We landed straight on, what was I think it was 98 this year or something of that sort, mm-hmm. but it was just solid 10 year old right is it, it is a 10 year old it is yeah it's a really interesting uh tropical fruit explosion year for old forester it's kind of a weird one and what's the um, uh, what, what was the because that, that the that's the youngest it's been in a while in a while but it's yeah. been down to nine yeah. it has been nine before i think it's just since it's been popular people have known it as 12 years old so they just right. think oh it's a 12 year old expression it is not the case um it, will it always be 10? Will it be nine next year? Will it be eight the year after? No, I'm not saying that. It's just as 
whatever it's going to be. Your process is just finding the barrels you like, what's hitting it. Yeah, and make sure there's, you know, enough barrels to where you don't have that many people pissed at you because you can't avoid people being pissed at you in September. It happens every year. We're used to it. But this year was a terrifying moment because the barrels were housed in two different spots. There were some in H House, which is my favorite warehouse, and there were some in J House, which is like Spice Bomb Mm -hmm. Center of Brown Foreman. Um, and those barrels in J House, there was only one lot left of them. And I was like, well, this would be good to balance it out because the stuff in H is usually pretty aligned with my palette, right? I'm like, this would be a good little, there'll be some good dimension here. And every single one of the barrels had been sampled before from R&D and every single one of the plugs was leaking. And I was like, shit, 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 shit. We're not gonna have any whiskey left. There's gonna be nothing here. Everyone's gonna be so pissed off. What is gonna go on? Um, so... Luckily, they didn't leak that much. They kind of uh-huh. clogged themselves up a little bit, but there were some that were still actively dripping when I went in there, and it had been years since they pulled R&D samples on them. So, um, But I guess there's still the same amount going around. It feels like less every year because we're spread out to more markets every year. But And the, just the bourbon category oh. is growing at people in it. And oh, yeah, that's a, completely. I think that's probably the number one driver, to be honest with you. Yeah. You oh, know, I... Here's the thing. I, I have a confession here that Please. it was not R and D. You know, it was you. We've every now and then I've been going into that warehouse and cracking those barrels. He's got they got this janitor key ring. Well, of, I of need warehouse. you to do a better job of plugging the holes, Fred. Because, I'm so man, sorry, but really, after you've had a few barrels, it's <laughs> once you're on number fifteen, you, <laughs> you kinda, know, you just like you just drill and walk away. It's you don't have that same kind of attention to detail, you know. It happens. And, you know, when you plug it with those little cedar spires and you're in a heat cycle warehouse, pressure builds up. Sometimes mm-hmm. they push them out a little bit, but... I, I mean, bet you anything that that little extra air in there gave it a little bit more yumminess. Probably. You know yeah. me, I love my oxidized whiskey. Mm. I want to put, like, fish tank aeration pump into barrels and, like, literally pump bubbles into it. Just That's a, just me being weird. I mean, yeah, just a, a constant like vacuum of stuff, just like moving stuff around. Yeah. Is that no, what I want to. I want to age everything with a hole in it, a hole, a breather hole in the barrel, and I yeah. want to flow oxygen. I'm dead serious about this too. Like, I I want to fill a fish tank full of whiskey and just like pump air through it, scoop it out with a ladle. I'm sure you got a few extra barrels laying around that they'll be like, sure, go for it. Can they expensive fish tank set up? I mean, uh, probably. Can I put a Fred fish in there? Can I get like. The background picture, you know, of like aquariums, can it just be like Fred Minnick? We can probably put like a video background of it and him just like floating this through it. Is, this, this is getting, this is getting, getting weird. weird. Yeah. Yeah. Fred and it's scuba weird. gear. Yes, just scuba like, hey. Fred. <laughs> I love it. I don't know. We'll see. I think that there's definitely something to be said there, though. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. But you haven't gotten your sample yet. You'll get your sample yes, eventually. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And you'll like it. It'll be good. Maybe you won't. And, you know, if you don't, just don't tell me. I'm sure it'll be fine. It's always it's always a knockout. So it's always everybody's, good, everybody's, but sometimes it's better. I'm not going to lie. Like, there's been some years where I'm like, huh, eh, it's good, but, like, I've had better. Like, whatever. What's the What's the thought process of something where you try it, you think you nail it, and then all of a sudden you go to, like, bottling and dumping, and you're like, does, does this... Is this exactly how we remember it? I can't remember. Um, it's always different. The key is to go through that enough times where you know what the difference is going to be. So mm-hmm. when you taste it straight out of the barrel, you're not tasting for perfection in that moment. You're tasting for perfection after being dumped, after being filtered, after all of those different things happen. And so it does take a while to sort of acclimate yourself to thinking in those terms. Um, but yeah. It's always a surprise. I mean, is it like a blend a where you're, where, I mean, cause you know your warehouses and you kind of know your mm-hmm. barrels. And, and so like, once you, once you get done with it and it's dumped and you're like, oh man, it could use like two more barrels of this over here. Like, are you able to go and still do Dump that? that? No, yeah. uh, no, you can't go back. Um, but once it's dumped, like it's that, that's it. There's no, there's no touching it. Yeah. Well, yes. other than that one year where there were like two different proofs on Old Forester birthday bourbon, you had oh, to put man. like stickers on them. I know. I remember that. That was not fun. Um, <laughs> We could have very easily like covered that up. We didn't. It was like, oh, whatever. We messed up. We lost some vapor in the bottling process and it dropped. Oops. It happens. Like, you're welcome. It was not done on purpose by any means. Um, That's not what I heard. The well, great, it wasn't. The great proof scandal of... Uh, the great proof scandal. <laughs> kidding. Make sure you find both of them. Yeah, they just <laughs> put a few Dysons above the tanks and just started like <laughs> sucking, right, sucking alcohol exactly. vapor out. No, it's a... Uh, but I mean, to your point though, like... 
that's what makes this new expression of the single barrel program. Look at that transition. Uh, so exciting because it is straight from the barrel. Like there's no filtration that happens. You take the char chunks out, but that's it. Yeah. It's going to, there's going to be that slight moment of aeration with the dumping of the barrels. But other than that, it's true to form. So when I find barrels that are like, holy shit, this is amazing. Just as it is, you can actually capture that in bottle and share it with people, which is so cool. Yeah, that's actually a very good transition. Yes, see how I did that. I mean, you totally, totally <laughs> teed that up because you, you've been kind of fighting for the consumer for a while. Oh, I know, I know, yeah. Fred's been a big cheerleader of yours after you know taking Old Forester Rye, you know, putting it the price point that it is when it could easily be double, if not triple, and then now the Old Forester Single Barrel Program is extending itself from what was just only a ninety proof mm -hmm. into a, a hundred and barrel proof. Mm -hmm. Time to talk about your. Uh, your internal political, like, um, well, like I mean, cheerleading had to do. It's, I will say that Chris Morris is a big advocate of the higher proof stuff. You know, it tickles his fancy, just like it does a lot of consumers. And so he's always a really big supporter of doing things like this. For me, it wasn't necessarily this idea of like, well, how can we get it as high proof as possible? It was, I have these amazing moments when I'm just there in the warehouse, it's totally silent. And all you can hear is sort of like this slight hum of like air circulating through the vents that we do the heat cycling through. And yeah, there's spiders. And every now and then you hear someone like three floors below you singing like Bon Jovi randomly or something like the warehouse dudes come through. It's got um, their AirPods on and just going at it. Or but something. then you have, I don't taste in the warehouse. I used to taste a lot more in the warehouse just because, I mean, do you blame me? Like whatever. Every now and then you get curious and you just kind of like let the let the flow kind of hit your mm -hmm. face a little bit, but um, I don't know. And then you, when you taste this whiskey right there and it's still the exact same temperature at the inside of that barrel right in front of you and you're just surrounded by the fumes of it all and you're just like, holy hell, this is perfect. It's perfect. It doesn't need to be blended. It doesn't need to be proofed. It doesn't need to be touched, but I'm the only person in the entire world in this very moment because it'll keep changing the longer it sits there. This is the only moment like this that will ever exist. This is the only time it'll ever taste like this. Why can't we capture that and share it with other people? Um, so for me, it wasn't ever coming from this perspective of like, oh, high proof whiskeys are trending and everyone's getting into that. And people are getting more accustomed to aged spirits. And now it's not just like diesel fuel anymore. 80 proof is mild. And no, it was more so like whiskey is meant to be shared and enjoyed for exactly what it is in that exact moment. And there's just something about that. That's why I fought for the non-filtered aspect of it big time. And everyone's like, oh, well, it's going to flock and oh, it's going to be ugly on the shelf and oh, people are going to complain and okay, let them type up a little letter. Hey, heads Wait. up. There's going to be some stuff floating in there. Doesn't send mean it's it to bad. The, the inbox of Jackie and uh, we'll, we'll see how yeah, many actually send start. Send it right to me. Um, <laughs> Put that in the spam folder. Kinda wanna, never, I kind of want to give uh, folks some um, some perspective here on like why this is such a like a big thing because Brown Foreman for a very, very long time uh, was adamantly against uh, barrel proof products mm. uh, in whiskey. They, they had, they had, there was like, uh, I have an internal memo from Brown Foreman, I think 70s or 80s um, about this, that they were not. Do you have access to that in the archives or is that still new to you there, That's Jackie? That's in the room that you take you in to <laughs> tell you where the room. bodies are. <laughs> it's a special room. <laughs> but they, they had this like belief that, you know, uh, high proof stuff was you know, irresponsible. And that's how a lot of people thought until like bookers came out and then they saw that there was like a connoisseurship and a desire to have higher proof products. And I would say, you know, especially with Jack Daniels, Brown Farmer was really late to this, you know, the high proof party. And um, I dare to say that there are not many whiskeys that are better than barrel proof brown foreman like king of kentucky incredible example mm. i mean that just that i have not had a bad king of kentucky i wish i had them all but i haven't had any king of kentucky no way Dead serious no serious are you serious how Dead is that serious. possible you work there it's only so many hours in the day my liver can only handle some. I don't know. I, I do my job. But I mean, I you home. can. But you can have King of Kentucky if you yeah, want. Yeah, she gets. I gotta from find it. She just doesn't get the bottle. Oh yeah, I mean, I guess I could look the barrels up in this system. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> oh! Now we just think about it. Oh, Wait a thanks minute. Thanks for the idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I did drink that one already. Mm. Actually, drink. No, I it. haven't. I mean, I hear great things about it, but it's one of those things that like it's so limited, and you know. I get enough whiskey as is. Let the people have the whiskey. 
I don't need it. No, you're like, you continue to be the, the hero of the people. I am the hero of the people. I try to be. I'm, I'm here for the people. They, I am. They don't know where caves, but she wears a brown Foreman cave. Yes. I don't know. Today I at kimono. <laughs> I could see you. I could see you like, you know, like a cape and like a couple barrels. It's like, you know, you're, you know, comic book it up. If you could picture yourself as a superhero, that's what it's going to be. I Anyone that hears this, if you are an illustrator, I will commission you to make a bourbon superhero character for me and for Fred All right. and for Kenny. I'll take one. All of us. Yeah. Who, who's the villain? Ooh. If Why did a whole list of names just roll through my mind? <laughs> 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 because if we're going to be like, you know, some kind of like superhero thing, there's got to be a villain. V. V for vodka. Vodka villain. I'm trying to think of something that would be like a potato kind of villain. Yes. Something like around those lines. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. We could really get the, creative with yeah, this. I mean, this the could the be community great. might eat that one up a little bit. Mm. I like it. Awesome. See? New or, ideas. All yeah, and like his sidekicks are like uh, chill filtration. <laughs> <you know>? <laughs> <laughs> oh, exactly. The, the, oh my gosh, no. I was like, is a, is a thief like an animated person too? Is it just like a, like a, looks like a noodle just kind of like moving around something like that? Yeah. Well, you know, that could be like the, um, you know, one, somebody's weapon, you know, there's like, mm. um, oh yeah. You know, it's like a laser, pew, 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 <laughs> you know, <laughs> throw bungs like ninja stars. Yeah. Oh like, yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh, you guys. We're onto something here. We are. Mm -hmm. No one steal it. No one steal it. So Jackie, there's another I thing it. I want to kind of go with too, is with this whole, uh, you know, choosing the barrels and everything like that, because, you know, through the single barrel program, if, correct me if I'm wrong, we did one not too long ago, uh, it was the 90 proof, but I think most of those barrels around like four years old that are going into mm -hmm. the single barrel program. And then, so when we're looking at uh, everything that's going into the, you know, we'll say just the birthday bourbon, we're looking at, you know, nine, 12 years old. So where's this middle ground at? You know, you've got some stuff that's, you know, six, seven, eight years mm -hmm. old. I mean, is that the stuff that's going into some of the, the, the Whiskey Row series? Like what, where's, where do the, where do those kind of play? To enjoy whiskey, all one has to do is drink it. But to understand and experience whiskey, one must participate in its creation. And for over 20 years, the Thousand Oaks Barrel Company has been supplying kits to do just that, including personalized oak barrels, ranging from 1 to 20 liters in size to custom age your own spirits or cocktails. But they now have their newest kit called the Whiskey Experience. And this complete kit allows you to make, age, and taste your own whiskey. The whole package comes with a new American white oak barrel that's one or two liters in size and includes everything that you need to make 10 different styles of whiskey from around the world, including American whiskey, Irish, Scottish, Japanese, and Canadian. So, are you ready to take the journey? Visit 1000oaksbarrel.com, which is number 1000oaksbarrel.com and use code BP2020 to get 10% off your very own whiskey experience kit. There are more craft distilleries popping up around the country now more than ever before. So how do you find the best stories and the best flavors? Well, Rackhouse Whiskey Club is a Whiskey of the Month Club, and they're on a mission to uncover the best flavors and stories that craft distilleries across the U.S. have to offer. Rackhouse's box ship out every two months to 39 states across the U.S. In Rackhouse's April box, they're featuring a distillery that mixes Seattle craft, Texas heritage, and Scottish know-how. Rackhouse Whiskey Club is shipping out two whiskeys from Two Bar Spirits located near downtown Seattle, including their straight bourbon. Go to rackhousewhiskeyclub.com to check it out and try some for yourself. Use code PURSUIT for $25 off your first box. So where's this middle ground at? You know, you've got some stuff that's, you know, six, seven, eight years mm -hmm. old. I mean, is that the stuff that's going into some of the, the, the Whiskey Row series? Like, what, where's, where, do the, where do those kind of play? Yeah, so the barrels in that six to ten-year-old pasture, kind of, is the best way I can describe it, are hanging out there. And we pluck those here and there um, for a different blend. So a lot go into the 1920. Mm -hmm. A lot go into the 100 Proof Everyday Offering. And... um yeah, depending on how many there are and how consistently they hold up a flavor profile, sometimes they just go into other random things. Uh, some go into Statesman. Statesman's kind of weird, though. Statesman, you know, we only pluck from hot spots. 
that's never the same age. You know what I mean? Like there's only so many spots. So you got to combine what you can. What, why, why Statesman? Is it, is it weird like that? Kind of give us a little bit. Of um, the Statesman product was designed to be hotspot whiskey just by nature. The whole concept that followed parallel with the character development in the Kingsman Golden Circle film. Uh, the one that Taron Egerton was uh, playing, Eggsy, where character builds with hot situations. Like, and that's kind of where it came from. So yeah, you've got corners, you've got perimeter barrels that sit in the sun their entirety and uh, the ones that sit by the heat ducts those are the ones that go in so you're only plucking like one or two barrels out of a lot at a time interesting all over the yeah. place to shove into that blend you're not taking whole 31 barrel ricks and cramming them together so yeah it's kind of just a weird little puzzle they're there they're hanging out they're there for the picking they just kind of get sectioned up and chopped up and put here and there and whatever there's not a consistent you know, age isn't a goal for us. We don't have like, oh, it's an eight-year product, so we got to save the eight-year whiskey for the eight-year product. No, like we don't do that. Um, there's a couple of them, some older ones in the single barrel program that I've hidden. I probably shouldn't say that. We're nah, fired good. I was days, like, we're getting ready but... to do our single barrel selection for barrel proof soon. So, oh well, let me know. Um, okay, we'll do. I do have a I question. I do have a question on the single barrel uh, program. Uh, do you? Um, do you, do you do you have access to like a the entire like warehouse or do you have to go with like you know a rack of that day of when you're doing like a barrel pick? I select them lot by lot. So when I say mm -hmm. lot, I mean 31 barrels typically or one rick. So the warehouses are structured with eight floors. There's a center aisle and on either side of that aisle is a rick and a rick. Um so there's 62 barrels across, but there just has to be a hallway in the middle. Um, when I go in there, I identify them in inventory first and then go to the warehouse, pull the samples, taste them, and then approve them. Um, those are lots of barrels that haven't been assigned to another product yet. Mm -hmm. And so they're not held specifically upon entry into the warehouse for a single barrel. They're already mature and ready to go. Um, I won't taste anything that's less than four years old because we won't go any lower than four years old. And when I pull those samples, those are the samples we send out. I'm not going to send you a three-year-old sample and sell mm -hmm. you a five-year-old barrel. You know what I mean? Like, what would be the point? So, um, yeah, I don't know if that clarified any of it. Well, but, like, so like, let's say you those six, 62 barrels or 61? Uh, there's 31 per rick. Okay, so, so 62. 62. Do you, do you uh, sample, do you keep sampling out of those barrels until they're all taken? Or do you... Do you uh, mix in other barrels when, one, once one is taken? Currently, I've got about four or 500 barrels in an inventory spreadsheet that are part of the program. When I go in to sample those barrels, I take 750 milliliters of barrel strength juice, bring that back, okay, taste it, good, good to go, great. Something kind of wonky, hold it, maybe taste it in six months, taste it in a year, mm. just let it hang out. Um, but then you take those samples, that 750 will give you four market samples. So you've got four tries, and if someone still hasn't bought it, let it sit. Or yeah, you know whatever they just kind of hang out there. Do so. people uh, um, will people will you put the same barrel out for multiple groups to pick out? Not at the same time. Okay. Yeah, there's the three piece set that goes out, and those samples are held until a decision's made, and then whatever two weren't chosen go back into the pool to be shipped out to other people. Yeah. I think that's just I just like I like talking about the procedures of all this stuff. Cause, yeah. Because we get we just get it and we're like, oh, it's a barrel. I mean, but there's so much work that goes into. Oh my gosh, that. yeah. Well, it's no. that, and then you know when you because I've we pick some of our stuff that's out of market because it goes through keg and bottle in San Diego, mm. and so sometimes they'll send us stuff and they'll be like, have you picked yet? Have you picked yet? Have you picked yet? We're waiting for other stores to go. Have you picked yet? And we're like, dude, the, they're still on the mail truck. They haven't even arrived yet. So I mean, they're they're like because they want to get those samples moving to the next people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's for sure. It's a, yeah, it's a very complicated process. I mean, like you said, when, on the receiving end, it's like, here's this liquid that just kind of showed up. But from my side of it, it's going through and tagging all the, the barrels are all numbered very systematically. So I know exactly where they sat in the warehouse because we're heat cycled. So top to bottom doesn't matter, but outside to mm -hmm. inside does. So I have to keep track of that somehow. Um, and then the drill holes are actually done at very specific points so you can see what the liquid level minimum is on that barrel. Because if it's too low to process, then you can't use it. And then I save it in my low barrel stock, which I have plans for mm. coming up mm. in early the spring. Short, the short barrel. Oh, 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 oh. oh That's my. That's what I have to say about that. Hmm. I love those barrels. They're the best barrels, in my opinion, is the barrels that you barely squeeze anything out of them. So, so what are you bad. trying to squeeze out of them? Good whiskey. And then they go into what? To things. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, folks, just, we just nice learned try. about uh, Jackie's uh, 
a liquor cabinet at home. <laughs> Either that or uh, something that hasn't hit TTB yet. Everybody will mm. be waiting to see. Who knows? Not going to say anything else. No. We no. got a lot of exciting stuff coming up. I mean, okay, so it's the 150th year, right? Old Force was right in 1870, hence Brown Foreman started. And so, of course, there's something coming still this year. That's very exciting that I don't think I'm supposed to talk about. I'm allowed to say fall and I'm allowed to say something. Is it in a fancy decanter? It's not in a de- Well, no. Let's play a game of like guess who. Yeah. Like, you know, then you got to like, you know, put down like, does they have red hair? Nope. Oh All my right, gosh. Put it down. Please make a whiskey new product guess who board where it's like decanter, amber glass, clear glass, export only. Oh, in the- Over yeah. eight years, under eight years. Yeah, back, exactly. <laughs> Backstory, state of distillation, you know. Do the whole thing. Yeah. You know, well, I, there's, Old there's Forester is so cool because it's been with the, it's, you know, it's been with the same company since 1870, you mm-hmm. know, and it's just, uh, it's just so cool seeing the brand have a revival. Um, my favorite, um, my favorite Old Foresters, and it's a shame you don't like old whiskeys. I wish I could get you to change your mind a little bit here, but some of these, uh, some of these products from like the 1940s and 1950s, and they're kind of like a little circular Shape. I'm thinking if they're, if Old Forcer is going to be doing a special product, it'd be like a like either the circular one or the one that looks a little slender and up like that. And it's not necessarily a decanter, but it's fancy. But uh, the, they used to do these like um, you know special offerings for the Kentucky Derby in the in the fifties, and they're just it's brilliant. It's like uh, I've tasted it once, and I've been seeking a bottle ever since. Do you think, though, that, I mean, the bourbon consumer knows more than I do every single day? And do you think that people are a little bit more critical of price point now than they have been before? Do people I, see things like that and go, you're paying for the decanter? I think people are getting less worried about the price point nowadays. Really? I personally, I mean, don't be wrong. You've, you've been on the, you've, you're fighting on the side of, you know, the old forest ride, trying to keep it super low. And, mm-hmm. and it's, a, it's a really good product. But I mean, you throw that in a decanter and you put it for $100 people are going to buy it. People yeah. are, consumers are are just taken away with packaging. I mean, that is, that is a, it's a big part of it. I mean, we, there's not a better case study than Blanton's. Blanton's is just, I mean, it's okay to good whiskey and that, but that, that uh, package, man, it just sings Kentucky. I mean, that is the best package in all of I don't want to say all of spirits, but definitely in an American whiskey, the little, you know, horsey on the top is, as, as my friend says, I got that whiskey with the horsey on the top. It just reminds me of Kentucky, you know? So, I mean, that's a good example. It is a really good example. And now you can't But find you it. say best as in like your home bar best, because any bartender will be like, I hate that bottle. It's well, impossible. that's right. We're talking about people who are going into a store and wanting some as a gift. I mean, it looks special. It yeah, does. it looks yeah. special. And and I think that's what I think that's what a lot of like those fancy bottle, I think that's a gift market, you know. It's mm-hmm. it's part of a luxury good like I want to get my my wife something, you know, really nice. She likes bourbon, so I want to get her a really nice bottle. And the guy doesn't know anything and he picks up you know, what he thinks is the best bottle. She gets it. Oh, you got me Blanton's. Oh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I guess I'm so like bitter and scorned about the whole, I think of it differently now from now being on the other side of it and knowing what packaging actually costs and how those things are, yeah, you right. know, yes. considered. And it's like, oh, now every time I see a bottle on shelf, I'm like, like how much, well, how that, much that bottle cost, cost you? Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Well, I mean, doing. that that is, that is true. Um, but, um, you know, I'm just looking at, you know, Kenny's here and you can see like, there's a lot of uniform bottles there and there's, um, mm-hmm. you know, but, uh, plenty you know, people that love to use that wine glass, but it's also like the, the label too, you know, the label is, is very important. Um, I don't know. How do we get, yeah, how, do we, how do we get on? You want to change directions a little bit? Sure. Yeah. yeah. There's, I have like, I don't, I hate talking about this. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. I hate because... talking about labels and package and pricing <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's a uh, one i want to hit on president's choice a second okay but I, before i do that i'm going to kind of go back to the barrel proof uh for the the old okay. forester single barrels because anybody that has not done a barrel selection from old forester yet you get to try my barrel proof mm-hmm. and i mean they're they're up there like 130s right like, yes yeah i mean there's there's no joking around and i remember going through there and actually get him dialed back down to 90 and i'm like oh, okay good i actually almost enjoy this better like i might actually enjoy the 100 proof better than i will barrel proof but i have a feeling people will chastise me if i don't get the barrel proof oh you should never i i 
I understand and I agree, probably do have that feeling. I mean, you just told me you do some duh. Yeah, you do. But like, don't feel like that. That there's that's this, this thing. Like everyone feels like they have like you're a better bourbon drinker the higher you go and prove or the more you can handle or something yeah. like that. It's some sort of like competition. Like, no. I literally get paid to drink bourbon for a living and I don't drink it at high proof ever, ever. It's just I think there's something to be said for some of the most like beautifully balanced, delicate whiskeys out there, especially a lot of the old world whiskeys, mm-hmm. like they're are not high proof, but they're gorgeous. No, I, I'm right there with you. 100 proof is that's why. Because we could have kept 90 proof or barrel strength, right? But we upped the program to 100 proof or barrel strength because the barrels that were coming through, just I had way too many that I thought were just, we missed the point. We went too far with the water edition. And then someone's going to miss, you know, a gorgeous product. Not that they weren't good. They were good, but they could be better. Yeah. I mean, that's what I almost like, I have even more respect for if you're drinking these things at 130 proof and sampling through them. Cause I was, I mean, we just did, I think what, three or four barrels, maybe four or five when you do it. And I was just like, man, my, this is, this is something that is not sustainable to do on a, on a long-term scale. No. I add water back when I taste them. I mean, you have to. That's where defects show up. They mm-hmm. never show up at barrel strength. You have well, to add water Well, that's what Seagram's uh, used to cut. And they had this whole manual on cutting to, um, I want to say it was 30 proof mm-hmm. because that was the best place where they could find flaws. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and I had this conversation with Jim Rutledge and he was he was adamantly against it. He was like, oh, you should be tasting a barrel proof. You know, and uh, there's... And he had a Marlboro Light hanging out of his hand at the same time. <laughs> he actually time. probably did. Yeah, exactly. You know? I love Jim. But, uh, uh, you know, Chuck Cowdery wrote about this um, in his uh, his book, uh, uh, Bourbon Straight, which came out in 2004. I recommend everybody get that book. It's a very good bourbon book. And he talked about how, like, um, it's like the macho manly thing of like, oh, I can drink high proof. You know, it's like, you know, it's not, it's not whiskey. So. Well, I mean, and this is a much bigger conversation, I'm sure, and we can get to President's Choice. But quickly, though, I think that the category was marketed for such a long time to a specific gender. It was. Everybody that worked in marketing for whiskey was male. Okay? So, of course, mm-hmm. you're marketing to what you know. And then to the other side, you're just making assumptions. So once that has shifted everything has been a little bit different, but now you're still trying to grasp an identity of masculinity within the category. And I think that's where the high proof argument has started to come into. So that's why I'm saying everyone, please just, I'm giving it to you at barrel strength so that you can find where you want to drink it at. Mm -hmm. But for the love of God, please be careful with it because it is high proof. Anyone remember back in the day when I was like Bacardi 151 was like, oh my God, you can light that on fire. Like it was like a whole thing. Like no one's going out and buying it and drinking it. You know, like no one's like, I'm getting notes of peaches. And like, no, no one's doing that. So like, why are you- In college, um, I think um, things happened with Everclear. (laughs) You know, I mean, it just that uh, those things- It served its purpose. they, They have a moment. And it's yeah, called a quick one. 21 <laughs> on a Delta Chi balcony. Oh my gosh. I know, right? I just like, oh my God. It's just the memories start rushing back. Go back to the yeah, cheeseburger. Go back to the cheeseburger. Go back to just the remember the cheeseburger. cheeseburger. All right. Okay. I'm okay. Back. Mm, yeah. Cheeseburger. So, because the last time we haven't had you on for so long that, you know, there was even the other product extension, which was the president's choice. Yes. And so, kind of talk about, you know, I remember when it was during the launch, I, I remember, actually, I remember that very vividly because we, myself, Ryan and Fred were all there and we were just getting ready to start forming Fred joining the podcast when we were actually there for President's Choice. And I think one of the stories was, you know, Campbell kind of felt a little bit out of his comfort zone when you gave him a ton of samples and said, have at it. He still does. <laughs> I just got a setback from him. I gave him quarantine homework once we went through shutdown. I was like, this would be a good time to get another set of these knocked out. He's at home. Um, it took a long time to get the answers back. And even when he gave them to me, he was like, I don't know. I mean, I like this. I like this one. I like this one. But you know, but I mean, I, I'm not making it. You, you, you do best. You, you just pick one. I'm like, no, no, no. It's your choice. It's your El called Presidente. The Presidente. Yes. Yeah. You have to pick it. I've, I've given you no wrong answers. Like just grab some, right? So he just, Campbell, you know, is the most modest and humble human being. Like you would never know Campbell was like, I, the Brown family is so great, but Campbell is just so human. Like he just really, really is. And like, 
as so many people have this perception of the Brown family as being like up on this pedestal and they're very, you know, they're very well to do and all these other things. And everyone has their own perceptions of what they're going to be like in person. And they're so kind. Campbell he never buttons his shirt up all the way. No, he's a, always a telling a joke. Yes. Up. He's amazing. Um, but like he knows business left, right, up and down, like can school you on it all day long. He does not feel comfortable with his palate, and he should. He's been drinking this stuff for how long now? Like, he knows the flavor profile of Old Forester better than anybody on that team. Mm. Better than Chris Morris, probably. You know what I mean? Like, he's been around. This is his family. It's always been there. I just wish that he would grow confidence in it, because he does do a good job. If you've tasted any of the president's choices, he, you know, those are his. He, Campbell, there were listening. rejects. There were ones that didn't make the cut. We yeah. believe in you, Campbell. We believe in you, we Campbell. We believe in you. He does a good job. So yeah, that next lot has been cleared. Um, I think that those will start coming out early fall, maybe. We have so we have a lot of things happening. We kind of talk about, I mean, is it R&D that tries the barrels first, then it gets the Jackie test, and then it goes to the Campbell test? Like, I go straight the, to the barrels. You So it goes, mm-hmm. the, it goes Jackie, barrels, Jackie, Campbell. It goes Jackie... Typing into an inventory sheet, looking up barrels that are over eight years old that are in the warehouse. And is that one of the like the requirements for it, at least eight years old? What it was supposed to be. The first two selections of the president's choice, uh, so barrel one and two, were chosen. Were you all there? You were there for mm-hmm. the KDA-like yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff. And then Chris Morris was like, let's choose the first president's choice. And yeah, actually- my face was like, okay. <laughs> Campbell, Campbell always says, like, Fred, you picked it. I picked so apparently I picked the first one. Everyone blame Fred. So, but but that was like I. Those it, were six year olds. Yeah. Yeah. So those first two were six. Outside of that, the the spec as it is written in our system is eight years and up because that was consistent with the original expression. So, yeah. And by the way, that stuff in the sixties, oh, money. Yeah. And what the story behind it is that really it wasn't even like a consumer thing. It was actually the president gave it to either like business partners or other people as like a thank you. It wasn't something that was like in a gift shop. Yeah. So it'll, have, like, it'll have their names on there from back in the day. And then you'll Google them and you're like, oh shit, this guy owned like 15 banks, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> exactly. Like, like John hitters. Wayne's got one. Like it's, it was, I would say it was the first personal selection single barrel if you will it, it was done as a single barrel and it now, was done that whole swoop was it on a shelf somewhere now it was actually not the first blanton's was legitimately the first they were doing that like he was doing that in the in the 40s and 50s before okay. president's choice was happening i feel like it's gonna be like a simpsons thing like god ah, blanton's did it first yeah. <laughs> so i'm gonna go back to the 30s and sneeze and then old force <laughs> that's, that's gonna work mm, uh, geez, no and like I, <laughs> Honestly, all I know is that it, President's Choice Old School was just as you said. It was a gift. It was not something that hit a shelf anywhere. Um, it wasn't retail available. It was special, very, very special. Um, but so, so why why I, turn it into a retail item? Do you know? Well, we needed to find something that was only available at the gift shop, and we had just. I mean, we launched new Old Forster product every year for the past like seven years. Like it's been nothing but a slew mm-hmm. of new products. So. And then the stuff that you're going to now see coming out in the next, in this year and the years following was also still being worked on. So I don't know. It's different because Brown Foreman looks at it from a perspective like, oh, here's what our home places do. We've got our Jack Daniels home place. We've got our Woodford Reserve home place. We've got our, you know, Old World Whiskey home places, blah, blah, blah. They look at Woodford as sort of the pinnacle of comparison for bourbon, right? Obviously. So they're like, oh, the old Forster gift shop needs to have a distillery only selection because Woodford has a distillery only. Yeah, but Woodford's also got like three SKUs. Like we have like 11 kids. So we felt comfortable holding off on reinventing the wheel necessarily, but thought, you know, because we do all these things that are pertinent to the actual history of the brand, let's bring back something vintage and relevant. And it just seemed we have a president now. So let's do the thing. That is cool. And the fact is, is like, Again, it's been with the same company for the whole time, yeah. you know. So that's just it's, it's it's a beautiful thing actually when you think about it from a from a corporate history um with old old Forrester. And you mm-hmm. think about the lineage as well. I mean, mm-hmm. the president even Campbell Brown is now the one selecting those yeah. barrels that would have mm-hmm. been something that his grandfather would have done. Mm-hmm. His grandpappy. Yeah. Exactly. We kept the label the same as much as we could, that circular label. Not on the short, squatty, amber President's Choice bottles. Have you ever seen those? They're very, very small circular yeah. bottles. Um, I but love those bottles. the taller ones, we kept the same label, modernized the verbiage on it, but kept the same ink colors, kept the same 
factoids on there about being aged summers versus whatever. It's yeah, we try to keep it all the same. It's really cool. Well, Jackie, you weren't getting ready. To, I mean, we've we've definitely killed our uh, over our forty five minute window. We thought oh, we we're going to do, man. but this was this was easy and fun. I knew going yeah. into this, we we'd take a few turns, but well, it always maybe comes you back shouldn't to wait two years. Just <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa! I just whoa. I still can't believe it's been two years. Of course, I found many opportunities to hang out with Jackie and write yes. about her. So maybe maybe uh, maybe I'll just poke Kenny and Ryan a little bit more, you know, for a regular. It. We can do it. You know, there's going to be plenty to talk about. Yeah, well, let's, Trust do, let's do like a regular thing. But, um, you know, it's always fun having Jackie. I just love spending time with her. I think she's a great person to talk to just about life. And thank God the world cannot see our text exchange. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you keep that one. I haven't seen it either. I don't know if I want to. You never will. And you don't want to see Kitty and I. Nope, Ooh, I do no, not no, want no, any no, part no. of that at all. But thank you. It was fun. Absolutely. And so if people want to... F- follow you i know you're big on the ig game you want people to follow you there you can Um, you can throw that handle out there yeah so it's just my name jackie zykin j-a-c-k-i-e-z-y-k-a-n like she's hiking hiking with zykin that's right um but of course always old foresters website is where you're going to find information about what we're releasing through the gift shop hint really have to like throw that out there you want to pay attention Set up your crawlers and your bots now. You want mm-hmm. to creep on the old Forester gift shop retail offering page. Trust me. All right. That's, I know where I'm going. Yeah. Okay. I don't have my connection there anymore. Eric Brown's at Woodford now. No, <laughs> he's at all. He's, he's both. Eric Brown's everywhere. He's, he's at both? Mm. I, know it's done. Okay. I was just at the distillery yesterday. He was down there. There you go. He's great. Still got your connections. And if you ever want to yeah. just say wave hi to Jackie, you can always do so through Louisville's airport. So just go through the, oh, uh, yes. uh, you know, the, the walking path and there she is. I think you're making an old fashioned, <laughs> you're making an old fashioned. I think you're twisting a, an orange over top <sighs> of a glass, something like that. Uh, right something there. like that. Yes, I'm there. I look like 10 years younger and that picture was from like five years ago. But you know, that's just what happens. It's like, you know, <laughs> like when Barack was president and then when he left presidency, you could tell like, I oh, know, that, right? that took some age on. Oh, there you exactly. go. That's, drinking 130 proof yeah, whiskey every first day. first name basis was uh, Barack Obama. <laughs> you know what, Barack? <laughs> Did, <laughs> you know what, Barack? You know, I'll pull out the text message. I'll pull out the text message just now. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> all awesome. right let's go ahead and close this out so make sure you follow jackie on ig as i said you can wave to her through louisville's airport but make sure you saw you also follow bourbon pursuit on all the social medias and if you like what you hear support the podcast patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit fred it was an awesome episode today always great to talk with jackie yeah she's the best and i think we we hit a few different things about time travel too which mm-hmm. we always find out more about ourselves mm, cheeseburger <laughs> <laughs> with that cheers everybody and we'll see you next week cheers cheers, cheers.